All God's people said, Amen. Amen. Have you ever cried? I dare say most everyone here has shed a tear. I was preparing this sermon uh, weeks ago, actually, and uh, it's about it's about crying, it's about being sorrowful, it's about being sad. And I was trying to remember how many times I, I have really been broken-hearted and and just wept. And I thought about the, probably the, the one of the times that it really I was devastated was when my mother passed away with ovarian cancer, and it just devastated me and my brothers and at her funeral, uh, four grown men, my and my dad, five of us, we wept over the loss of my mother. And I was in my office. I have an office at home, you know, one of our bedrooms. We've turned into an office. And then I started to think, you know, it wasn't just sad times that I wept. I remember that my wife and I, Susan, we'd been married uh, for 10 years, and then we'd been trying to have children, and Laura came along. And I was uh, 31 years old when I held her in my hands, and I remember weeping because I had a child. God gave us our first child. And those were tears of joy. And through the years of my life, there have been times that I have shared a great deal of tears. I'm somewhat of an emotional person. Uh, in case y'all didn't know that. Just in case you didn't know that. And so I began to prepare a sermon and I began to think about how many times people I've been with have cried. And I've been with a lot of people through the years. I walked up uh, to St. Dominic's Hospital to a guy that was six foot six and weighed 285, 90 pounds that everybody in Carthage, Mississippi was fearful of. And he'd been diagnosed with cancer. The doctor had told him he had four months to live and he was leaned up against the wall and he was weeping. I put my arm around him like this and tried to comfort him, but he wept. And so through my ministry, I've been in the funeral homes with people that have just wept. I've been in the hospitals with people that wept, I, I was at Holly Bluff when a woman went through 12 hours of surgery and the doctor called the waiting room and asked to speak to the pastor. And you need to know if you're a family when they call and don't ask to speak to the family but the pastor, that is not good news, right? And they asked me to prepare the family because she had died on the operating table. And the family wept. I'd ask that you stand out of respect for the reading of this verse. Blessed or happy are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we trust you and we trust your word. For we have nowhere else to turn. And Lord, we trust your word with the very essence of who we are. Because we know you in a personal relationship. And Lord, we know your word because we study. And we know your word tells us that you're a God that cannot lie to us. And so Father, we are happy when we mourn. We are happy because we are sad. Because your word tells us that you will comfort us. Your Bible tells us, Father, that you are the God of all comfort. 
So, Father, we trust you. Lord, as we break open your word, touch our hearts and change who we are and allow us to see who you are in a better way. Oh, Father God, we love you. It's in your Son's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. You know, we live in a society today that doesn't think you ought to be sad or sorrowful. I want you to think about that. Every time I cut on the TV, I see trash and I see stuff that wants you to laugh. That wants you to be excited. That, that tells us things that uh, uh, are just are not true. And the world wants us to, to never mourn. To never be sorrowful. Live life to its fullest. Uh, I used to, uh, you know, some of the best TV commercials during the Super Bowl are, are, what kind of commercials? Beer. You watch them, Rob? I mean, they are, really. They are. And they're they're trying to to get you to be happy and excited, of course, to buy their product. But those are the happy commercials. They want you to be happy. And I like college football, and I, I used to love oh, uh, uh, the guy Culpepper. Y'all know who I'm talking about? Who? Larry Culpepper. That's right. Uh, y'all, some of y'all don't know what I'm talking about. Larry Culpepper, you know, he's the guy that invented the playoffs. Y'all remember? Come on, y'all work with me this morning. Come on, I know it's daylight saving time. We're just now supposed to be in Sunday school. But wake up. I'm not going to let you sleep. Wake up. Come on. And so he invented this playoff, or so he said, and he went through all this, and, and it makes you laugh, and, you, and you're excited. Uh, uh, Doug Flutie, y'all know who I'm talking about? He was recruiting Doug Flutie, and he was handing out T-shirts, and he said, Doug Flutie, uh, all you need is a boy's medium. You know, he's supposed to be a big football player. That kind of stuff, just to make you laugh, make you forget your sorrows and your troubles. It goes against Scripture. The Bible says, Happy are you that mourn. Happy are you that are sorrowful. Happy are you that are sad. Boy, how can that be? How can it be? You look at Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and it says there's a time to weep. I believe the Bible. And I remember when my mother died and I was weeping and I knew it was a time to weep. I mean, I was sad over the loss of my mother and I remember when Laura May was born and we brought her into this world and that doctor put that baby in my hand and I held that baby and I thought, oh Lord, I got a child I got to raise and what in the world am I going to do? But I was excited. I had a child. Susan and I had been trying for years to have a baby and I was excited and I was happy and I was glad. And then I remember 10 years later when I was 41 and Andrew come along and they put him in my hands and I cried and I said, what am I going to do? <laughs> How things can change, you know. It's just the truth. We're emotional driven people. And so there are times that we are to be sad. There are times that we are to weep. There are times we are to have tears, and I want you to see that. I want you to see some things. Have you ever wanted to run away? Now, I'm not talking about run away from home, kids. Don't don't. There's never a time that you should want to want to run want to run away from home. Never, Braden. You ever want to run away from home? Never. Why? Because that, where are you gonna go? Who's gonna feed you, man? You're a big old boy. Nobody gonna feed you. Right, don't run away, but there are times you want to run away from your problems, right? I mean, I, I feel sorry for certain people in their occupation, school teachers in our society today. I pray for you. I mean, you can't beat kids like you used to beat us. So I don't know how in the world y'all get through with these problem children. Don't be a problem child. Just don't do it. Have you ever wanted to run to a good place? I mean, there are places that are good. And have you ever wanted to turn away from your sorrow? 
Just think about those things. Look with me in Luke chapter 6. In Luke chapter 6 and verse 25, Jesus is speaking. He says, Woe, woe, or curse to you who are full, for you shall hunger. Woe or curse to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Drastic changes in life. You're full now, you're going to be hungry. Everything's going well right now, but there's going to come a time when you're going to weep and mourn. There are drastic changes in your life as you go through life. So how are you going to handle these drastic changes? So why do we cry? We're thankful, we cry. We have loneliness, we cry. We have great concerns in our life, so we cry. We have disappointments, and we cry. And we watch those silly Hallmark movies, right? And we watch them cry. And every now and then, if you get older, you know what you do? You cry with them. That's so sweet. So we have these emotional swings in our lives. And I'm going to give you three questions today. As you look at the Sermon on the Mount and the blessings, the first question you always ask is, what is Jesus actually saying? Last week, when you went to the first one, and it was blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God, it's talking about being humble, or humbling yourself to the point that you receive Christ. He's saying you need to be saved. When you come to the second, blessed or happy are those who mourn, what's he saying actually is you need to be broken over your sins. There comes a time if you're going to be saved, that you must be sorrowful over your sin. Are you sad over your sins? Has there ever been a point in time in your life that you were actually sad that you were a sinner? And if it never has been, then you never have been saved. Oh, preacher. You mean if I've never been upset that I was a sinner? I've never been saved? That's right. If you've never been upset over your sin, then you're calling God a liar. And who wants to call God a liar and think they're saved? If you've never been broken over your sin, if you've never been upset that you're a sinner, then you're saying, God, I'm just as righteous as you are. And God says, no, there's none righteous. There's none, no, not one. And you need to be broken over your sins. So he gives us a history, a history of sorrow. First, let's look at Matthew chapter 24. And let me begin to explain how God works this thing. Not my opinion, but what the scriptures actually tell us. Matthew chapter 24, verse 4. Jesus says, Take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. Well, that makes sense. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. He says, listen, there are going to be some people come and they're going to deceive you and they're going to tell you that you're all right. All you got to do is raise your hand and walk the aisle and you're okay. Everybody's trying to get to the same place and if you just try to get there with Him, you're okay. Let me tell you, you're not okay. You don't get there the same way as everybody else. You get there by being broken over your sins. Let's go to Psalms. Let's start in the Old Testament. Psalms 
41. This is the Psalms that we remember. Blessed is he who considers the poor. Or Psalms 42, excuse me. I want to talk about the deer. As the deer paints for the waters, brooks, so paints my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my food day and night, while they continually say to me, Where is your God? We like to talk about that deer and how, how it paints for that water, how it desires that water. That's how we need to desire God. And so we take that and that's how we apply it. It says, My th soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? We, like, we don't like to add that part. When am I going to appear before God? When am I going to stand before God and then we never put in verse 3, my tears, my broken heart, my tears have been my food day and night. I have been broken over my sin day and night. I have shed tears because I'm going to have to appear before God. We just like the first verse. It sounds so good. I'm going to seek after God like that deer needs that water. Let's just stop with that verse, preacher. If only the psalmist had. But he added the rest of it. and We take it in context. We don't pull it out just because we like that one verse. Go to 2 Timothy and let's see what the New Testament says about some tears. So what Paul has to say to a young preacher. 2 Timothy, chapter 1. That's a good verse. Verse 3, I thank God, whom I serve with a pure conscience, as my forefathers did, as without ceasing I remember you in my prayers night and day. How oh boy, he, he's praying for us night and day. Greatly desiring to see you, being mindful of your tears, that I may be filled with joy. The tears, the history of sorrow is found throughout the scriptures. People are broken, Old Testament and New Testament, praying for the lost soul. With tears. We're not through because you need to go to Acts chapter 20 and get the history of it. The Acts of the Apostles. Acts chapter 20 and verse 31. Therefore, watch and remember that for three years, three years, I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. He warned them. What was he warning them? You're okay. Is that a warning? We're all trying to get to the same place. Is that a warning? What's the warning? The warning is this. You need to be broken over your sins. And he warned them for three years, night and day, with tears. When do we shed tears over our sins? Remember, we'll cry when we're thankful and we'll cry when we're lonely and we'll cry when we have concern and we'll cry when we have disappointment and we'll cry when we watch a Hallmark movie. When do we cry over our sins? When? All you have are good times. Don't you like that saying? The Arabs can say, if you have nothing but sunshine, what do you end up with? A desert. A desert. 
if you don't have stormy weather, if you don't have wet, rainy weather, all you have is desert. Desert. Hot, beautiful sunshine day in and day out with no rain and no storms and no trials of life. No tears are shed. Desert. What do you grow in the desert? Nothing. Nothing. Look at the second question. I want you to see the second question. What is the reason for this mourning, the sadness, and the sorrow? Well, the answer is actually found... In 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10. It actually gives us the answer. I mean, it's spelled out. I'm not going to make this up. I want you to turn there and I want you to see the reason for sorrow. This is where God says this is what sorrow is all about. Not making it up. For godly sorrow produces... Right? Isn't that what it says in your scriptures? What does it produce? Somebody tell me. Repentance for godly sorrow over your sins produces repentance. To what? To salvation. That's what it's about. Godly sorrow produces repentance to salvation, not to be regretted. But the sorrow of the world produces death. If you're broken over your sins, you can have repentance and salvation. But if you've never had that sorrow over your sins, there is no repentance and there is no salvation. There is a positive and a negative. The positive is, if you have that sorrow, you repent, you have salvation. And the negative is, if you don't, you do not. And it's only left up to you. You're the only one that knows. And you can fool me. You can fool people around you. But you will never, ever, ever fool God. I didn't make that up. Did y'all see that? It was in the Scriptures. It was right there. And when you read in Matthew chapter 5 about mourning, in the Greek is a continual mourning. You're continually sad over your sinfulness. Every time you sin, it breaks your heart. Every time you do something wrong, it breaks your heart. And you want to make it right. That's why you go to Revelations chapter 21 and verse 4. And it says, And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And there shall be no more death nor sorrow. When you get to heaven, you don't have to worry about it because there's no sin in heaven. It's done away with. God gives you comfort. What's the reason for mourning? It's because when you begin to repent of your sins, and I begin to repent of my sins, The Bible tells us that God is the God of all comfort. And He begins to take us in His arms and draw us close to Him. And He loves on us. And He hugs on us. And that's comfort. He's the God of all comfort. Let me give you the third question. Go to the third question. How does someone become a mourner. How do you get to that point? Well, there's two ways. There's two things you have to do. Number one, you have to open your heart to God. Open your heart to God. How do you do that? Do you hate sin? Do you hate sin? I I mean, it's, it's pretty simple. Do you hate sin? I always use this illustration because it it just strikes every one of us, every one that has a set of, I brought them up here with me, these. Y'all know what these are? These are are my car keys. And so we put these car keys in the ignition. Now some of you don't even have to put them in ignition, right? 
What are you just doing now? Mash that button? So you mash that button, and you get under the wheel, and you get on a road, and you leave, and you go up this road. What's the speed limit on this road, Danny Mosley? What's the speed limit going up through here? 35. And so we're all going to run up to the pig and buy our lunch, and all of us want to be first, and so we're going to drive 34 miles an hour. Right? Nobody's going to break the speed limit. Right, Carrie? You probably are. You want to be first. Well, you know, you know the first shall be last. You know where that comes from? The highway patrolman pulls you over, and everybody passes you, so you become last. That's how that works. And the only time we hate our sin is when that blue light, you see it going round and round in your rearview mirror, and what do you think? Surely not me. Where was he the other day when somebody passed me? Doesn't matter, does it? We don't hate our sins. You want to become a mourner? See God for who he is. See God for who he is. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and He made each and every one of us. Do you see Him as that? Do you see Him high and lifted up and upon His throne and the right to rule and reign your life and my life? We don't see Him that way. We like to take Him off the throne and put Him in a chair beside us and put our arm around Him. And what a friend is Jesus. We don't worship a king. We sing to our buddy. We have the wrong view. The third thing is see yourself for who you are. Driving too fast. Telling the dirty jokes. Drinking too much. Doing things you know you shouldn't do. And not caring. You got to get that right. You can read Isaiah 55 7. Jerry, go to the next slide. Now you got to see the cross. You have to see his body on that cross. You got to see his body broken, and you got to see the nail prints in his hands and his feet. You need to see those. You need to see His blood as it's running down from His forehead and from His hands, His side, and His feet. And as it runs down, you've got to see it covering your sins. Can you see it? Do you know what it means to you? And Then you have to hear Him as He begs His Father. Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. He's begging for us. Father, forgive Andy May. And forgive each one of you. Because we really don't know what we're doing. He loves us more than we love Him. I want you to think about that. And we're going to have a hymn of invitation. As our people come to their places of service, I want to ask you a couple of questions. They're on the screen. Can you see your sins? Everybody's sins are not the same. But they all do the same thing. They separate you from the love of God. So can you see your sins? Do you know what you do that's not right in the sight of God? I'm going to tell you, you do. Every one of us here know, we know what we do that's not right. You know it. So what are you going to do about it? And because you know, here's the next question. Are you hurt over your sinfulness? Does it hurt you down to the very essence of your soul knowing that you do things that God doesn't like. 
Do you mourn over your sins? Are you sad over your sins? That's the questions you have to answer today. And if not, then you need to get right with the Lord today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. And we thank you for the blessings of life that you give us. And Lord God, I just pray that your Holy Spirit will touch our lives. That your Holy Spirit will, will dig deep into the crevices of our heart. And Lord, if there's sin there, that you will give us the strength and courage to address the sin. And Lord, to turn from our sin, to mourn over our sin, and to grow more like your Son, Jesus. Father, I also pray, Lord, if there's one here today that's lost, Lord, if there's one here today that's never mourned over their sins whatsoever, that, Father, that you give them the strength and courage to change their life, to come to you in faith, to be broken over their sin and to receive you as their personal Lord and Savior. Oh, Father God, make a difference today. Lord, we love you. And it's in your Son's name we pray. In the name of Jesus, amen. Let's stand. And as we sing and God's dealing with you, we want you to come quickly. We don't want you to look left nor right. We want you to step out and come in faith. Won't you come as we stand?